Welcome to episode 402 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and he's Levon, a.k.a. Barcelev. And today, well, it was El Clasico. Barcelona falling 3-1 to their eternal rivals. And you know, Levon, just some opening thoughts here as we get this one started jumping, diving right in. I'm caught between two minds. The excuses are built in. No VAR luck. Some lucky bounces for Los Blancos and no injury luck for the hardest month of the season. Certainly Barcelona without their best pound for pound defender. And yet I also find myself asking after this one and the two matches against Inter Milan, some big questions about where Xavi goes from here. Where do you think you land on that fence? uh, If you find yourself on that fence at all. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's not just about this game. It's about the last couple of games, right? Because uh, we went to uh, San Siro, we played Inter, um, should have come away with more than a loss, with a draw, uh, but we lost. Then we played Inter at home, we really should have won that one, uh, but we drew. Uh, then uh, we went to the Benavel. Um Honestly, I think that, you know, we should have drawn this game, um, but we lost. So the bounces went against us. Um, in an alternative universe where everything is the same, uh, those bounces might go in our favor and we come out of this, uh, feeling like gods, you know, um, at, at the same time, um, in none of these matches, we dominated to the point where, uh, you don't leave anything up to lucky bounces. And I think we have a team to at least dominate against Inter. So where does Xavi go from here? That That is the rough one, because it's not this match that matters or much, um, matters all that much for, for our season. Um, it's the next one against Villarreal and against uh, Bilbao, you know, all of these matches in this uh, grueling uh, October, early November run. Those are the ones that, uh, that matter a whole lot more because here is where we either uh, recover emotionally and get full points from these matches and then come back after the world cup to contend for the, for the Liga Liga title. Or if, we let our current uh, state, state, state of mind, state of um, well-being as a team uh, get in our way, and we drop points. If we do, I do not think that Real Madrid will will forgive us over the course of the season. That's a, that's a really interesting point about the next three matches being because of the result of the last three match or the last four matches rather the next three matches and the importance of Villarreal and Athletic Club and Valencia. And I'm disregarding Bayern Munich there because you're right that those matches and making sure this team emotionally and mentally recovers from these devastations and getting results in those is so much more important for the spring and this entire season in totality in the Liga, in potentially Copa del Rey, in Europa, wherever, wherever it may be. And so some of the big questions that, I'm going to be asking, and I think that we should rightfully discuss, like, what is the role moving forward of, or what should the role of Sergio Busquets be moving forward and questions like that, that I I really think we really need to take a hard look at and and really ponder. I think not to say that I want to have that conversation, but I think I begin it from a different spot than even I start when I hit record based on your words. And that is that if you take your captain and you really shake the deck up in a way that, kind of change the way that your team controls the match and the the way your team plays, you do run the risk of really upsetting the balance of everything. And that is the worry. And that is the concern. And, you know, so when people say, oh, this player should start, this player should start, we'll talk about Ansu too, but it's a lot easier to put Ansu in as a starter and rotate and rest Dembele and Rafinha, or you start Ferran Torres because you got a goal against uh, Real Madrid. You start him against Villarreal because maybe for the first time in the season, he's playing with confidence. It's a lot easier to rotate those four than it is to say, hey, Frankie de Young, here are the keys to the, to the kingdom. And even though we want you out, we try to push you out, here's the keys to Busquets' castle, and let's see what you can do. And that kind of transition feels like it's just one player for another. But you know, as you kind of laid out, it's not that simple. 
that upsetting the way you play and even emotionally taking your captain out of a prominent position at this point is a really risky proposition and not as easy as it may seem on paper as just plugging one player into a spot. Um, no, I think even like it, it might even be good emotionally to uh, to sit Busquets and um, give Henke de Jong the start. Um, what might hurt the team more emotionally is if you do not make those changes, because then what you get mm. is you have uh, you have a squad of players who um, who are frustrated that the team is losing and that they're not starting games. So I I, I think what makes sense for me, um, both on a football level and on a squad management and um, mentality level going forward, is is to not be afraid to continue making uh, making changes to those lineups. Um, but you know that's just one point of view. I know that everybody will agree with me because um, you know it's it's easy to point your fingers at certain players and blame them. Um, it's also easy to look at the scoreline and have that determine your view of what happened in the match. Um, I know that I tweeted out at halftime that I thought that we were playing better than Madrid despite the scoreline. And I got absolutely cooked for it. Uh, <laughs> you know, because because all, all the people look at is the scoreline. And I'm not saying that we were dominating, but Madrid wasn't doing anything. Madrid scored two goals because we messed up in two separate plays. Those are like 10 seconds out of 90 minutes, uh, out of 45 minutes in, in which we made stupid mistakes. We were in control the rest of the game. We were creating more than Madrid the rest of the game. There was that um, uh, that chance for Frankie, uh, and I think some people said that Lewandowski was offside for the ball that he shot over from one yard out. I don't know if he was or not, um, but Frankie could have gotten to that as well. Um, a couple of minutes later, uh, Dembélé had a close-range header. That uh, you know, I know he's not the greatest, but it's it's a good chance. Uh, well, Cavajal also had two hands, two magical Cavajal hands right in his back as well, can take him off it, so take him off the spot. But oh, yeah, yeah, that happens. happens. Um, <laughs> Rafinha had a shot from, from inside the box, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't think that we were particularly uh, poor in, in the first half, except for two moments. And I don't think that you can say that because of uh, two errors by individuals. That you can say that you can say that Madrid as a team played better than we did. No. Then yeah, I mean, I think my my prevailing thought throughout that game was that Barca's best is the same as Real Madrid's best. It's the same as Bayern's best, as Inter Milan's best. Like Barca's best, based on the team. I mean, the team that has been built and the quality of the players that exist in Catalonia is just as good as any of these other really, really, really good teams' highs. The problem with Barcelona is that their weaknesses are more easily expo exposed than the rest of these elite teams. And that's why, just kind of going back to the Busquets point here, that when I'm thinking about, you know, of course you and I are on Twitter, and it's a complete cesspool there, that the, the conversation we're having about the role of certain players, PK, Busquets, and Eric Garcia, I think, are the, the trio, right? The, the mm -hmm. best example, and you can I guess you can throw Alba in there too, as where... You know, I, I'd use the, the same analogy on Twitter as well. Like, it's like a friend where it's like a, a friend you've had for a long time, maybe from child or whatever, where you say, hey, we're friends and I rock with you. And it's always you and I, we're buddies, yada, yada, yada. But if you wrong me, then I'll cut you out of my life. It's toxic and you're done, right? And it's very melodramatic in that way. And I think that's certainly obviously how Twitter goes, where if when we, we say, oh, is this player, you're either for them, you're either in their camp and you have to defend them or you're out on them and it's done. And in the case of, Busi and PK and Alba and Garcia, it's really, really nuanced because in the case of, of PK, like I said that he was probably, I thought he might start this one because you'd want Kunde on the right side to deal with Mini mm -hmm. Jr. That's what I predicted would happen. I, again, totally understand why it was Kunde and you took the chance with Roberto and you, I mean, not to say you saw what happened, but I think you might have had a similar result with PK. Uh, anyway, but the point is for PK, you know, 35 years old, all those knee injuries as well. The club said, you're too expensive. We're trying to get you out. He didn't want to leave, didn't want to take the reduction. It is what it is. And he hasn't really been playing. And PK said, you're my fifth center back. And now injuries have kind of forced him in, into a certain role. 
But for PK, I think he might be past it. I think it might be time. I mean, we not to say that it, that we should def- um, you can defend him and say that he wasn't in form or he hasn't been playing. So how can we expect him to come up in a big moment against Inter Milan? But he didn't. And he had that opportunity and the club doesn't want him. So for PK, I think it's over and it's time for him to decide when he wants to gracefully try to leave the club, if he does or doesn't. In the case of Eric Garcia, he's a 21-year-old who needs to improve his defending, but he does all the offensive side of things. When Barcelona have 65% possession in every game, he's tremendous for 65% of the time. And then Vitter, 35%, you're kind of crossing your fingers and your toes and hoping he doesn't make some kind of mistake. But I also have seen him improve defensively since even the last year. And again, at 21 as, as a third center back or four center back, really he's Barca's four center back. He seems almost overqualified for that position. And that's totally fine. He's a young player who's being forced in a more prominent role. And then lastly for Busquets, before you take back over for Busi, like at the, at the start of the year, like I thought that he in 70% of Barca's matches this season, we have saw Barcelona control the game. They, they wear their opponent down as you brought up weeks ago, that their opponents by the second half are tired and gasping fair. And that's when Barcelona takes advantage of their superior of speed and on the wings and their superior uh, finishers. And so for 75% of the time, Busquets makes a ton of sense. But Barcelona's weaknesses are more apparent when the competition gets better, particularly at a counterattacking, when Busquets is on the field. And so there's this world where it's not about athleticism. It's just that in the way that midfields now must, we saw Chuamani and Cruz, like the way they rotate in for each other. There's this world where because the opposition knows exactly what Barca wants to do, play through Busquets in that way in the offensive third, that teams are able to counterattack to great effect against Busquets. The elite teams can do that, but the other 75 to 80% don't. So there's this world where Busquets really is just like your first pivot or your first midfielder off the bench because he controls the match better than everybody else. But he also dictates the way Barca plays. And he is, I mean, he really has to be, I mean, not blame, but we must say that Barcelona on the counterattack are weakest when it's Busi in the midfield. That's just the way it is. Um, is this true? We don't concede from counterattacks when Busquets does not play. Um, we, we, well, he, he, I mean, he plays like 90 minutes every single time. No, he was but, second on the team in minutes last year. But hold like, on. We don't have a big sample oh, size. I don't think we have a big enough sample size to know. You, you would need a bigger sample size to, to actually know, know that and point at Busquets. Uh, did we uh, concede from counterattacks? Yes. Were they Busquets' fault? Um, that I do not know. I know that... Uh, let's look at the goals that we conceded against... Inter. Uh, so in San Siro, yeah, you can say Busquets should have closed down, uh, what's his name, uh, Chalanolu. Um, he, he definitely should. Okay, but um, he, he didn't. It cost us the game. But we're talking about a game that we lost and Inter had an expected goal uh, of 0. 0.16. 0.16. Mm-hmm. In that game. Too. So, so I, even though Busquets should have done, defended better, it's a bit difficult for me to say, well, you know, Busquets was the problem. Um, it doesn't mean that... No, it, I, it, it, I don't and, think he's and, 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 and especially not on counterattacks, because we did not concede any counterattacks in Italy. So you cannot say Busquets is a problem against big teams because we, we conceded counterattacks. No, we didn't. Then the game in the camp now. Um, let's see, the, the, the first goal? That's That's not... Busquets' fault for conceding a counterattack. That's that was totally on Piquet. No, it's Piquet. Then, then, yeah, yeah, then, yeah, then, yeah, then, then the second goal. The problem is not Busquets conceding a counterattack uh, by not uh, being able to track back fast enough. The problem is Busquets giving up the ball needlessly. So, so here again, yeah, we can we can blame Busquets, but there's there's no analysis here that you can look at that goal and say, see, if we have a faster or more physical or more athletic pivot, that per- that person will get back in time to to stop that goal from ha- happening. No way. We, we had a midfielder who gave who gave yeah, the I mean, ball away. Then against against Madrid, we conceded two goals. Um, the, I mean, the first goal. Not none of the defenders get back in time, so why would it be the midfielder's fault for not getting back in time there? Um, yeah, I mean, I, again, I don't. I'm not necessarily like blaming Busquets. It's that with, because his position, and this is something I was. I watched. I, I tried to watch Liverpool Man City right after the game ended, and I think there's a fluidity in midfields now that does not exist in Barca's because 
Busquets, I mean, when we say irreplaceable, he's the best at what he does. And he still is at controlling and dictating matches in the way that he does. And so I noticed against Madrid in that first half, there was in a matter of about a minute and a half, three times, because Modric was face marking Busquets on the front, that Benzema would drop in. And I don't know if the center backs weren't warning Busi on this one, but three times Benzema came from behind, almost dispossessed him. And due to his technical abilities, Busi three times kind of pivoted mm-hmm. out of the way. And he's just so good on the ball, right? And then the third time he gets fouled. And then the, right after he gets fouled, this was really telling me, right after he gets fouled, he makes an uncharacteristic run to the, the near post. And that is when that attempt from Lewandowski, it didn't really lead to anything, but he, Busi gets ahead on it on the, at the near post and heads it back over in Lewandowski's path. Mm. The moment, just the only moment that Busi made a run into the box, things changed. And I think that was the difference between Real Madrid's midfield today and Barcelona. And again, it's not on Busquets because Busquets is the best at what he does in his position. My concern for Barcelona against these kind of teams is that fluidity in the midfield where it's not all on Busquets to get back and, and counterattack. Hold like I, we can say that Frank Young was out of position and he doesn't fit it and he doesn't fit as an interior because his positioning and we lock in his heat map. I'm not sure where he is at times either. Like what is the contribution that he is making into the box? What is the contributions that he is making cutting out counterattack? So no, it's not on Busquets, but when the system is based on Busquets and you see this fundamental issue with where Barcelona's conceding goals to top, top teams, then obviously the first question we must ask is Busquets. So I agree with you that it's not on Busquets. And that's why I said, like, he makes a ton of sense. And it's not about Busi out or Busi in. It's just about what is Barcelona doing in, in totality, like in that midfield. Mm-hmm. Like, I just, I think there's a sense of, there's a lack of dynamism that is coming, especially when teams are packing it in and playing a certain way. But any team that wants to go at Barcelona, obviously Busquets shoves it right back down their throat because nobody does what he does what he does. So I, I totally agree with your point that it's not all on Busquets, but I also do, again, fundamentally wonder how do you rectify some of Barcelona's weaknesses other than saying, I mean, it could just be some as simple as Ronda Rajo. I hope you get back and you can defend and you're healthy because yeah, a back line of Kunde and Araujo and some mystery right back that they'll sign next summer and Alejandro Nobalde, the way he's progressing, that's a, that's a pretty fine back line for next season, but that's not this season yet, even in the spring. That might be good. And Sergio Berto might be good enough. And Bayerine might be good enough just to limp you over the line at the right back position come the spring. And Barcelona are playing much better. And Busi is still starting as a pivot. There, that, that world totally exists to me. No, but I mean, I, I, I'm fine with phasing Busi out now. Um, I even started this podcast with me being the one making the argument that uh, it would be good and healthy for, uh, for example, Frankie to start over Busquets. Um However, I'm not sure if the analysis holds up. How many how many Madrid midfielders made runs into our box this game? None. The one I'm looking at in particular was on the second goal because once when when Cruz and Chuamani switched positions and Chuamani made that run into the box and then Benzema was able to be dragged wide. That's what left that space in for Valverde to come in the middle. So as much as we're kind of trying to say, oh, Barcelona didn't defend properly. It was really good movement by Real Madrid in that box, especially when their pivot made that forward run that unbalanced Barcelona's back. Yeah, but, so, but, I mean, but that, that play came out of a really weird game situation. Uh, because um, Eric Garcia missing that ha- header and mm-hmm. giving it giving it away uh, to um, Vinicius, who at the moment that we gave it away, Vinicius was basically uh, closer to the goal than anybody else on the pitch. That, yeah, I mean, that was a really that, bad bounce. I agree. I mean, that, luck-wise, that, like, how that, does that, that all falls in between Koundé mm-hmm. and Roberto to yeah. Vinicius' feet? Like, that's so unlucky. And, 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 and that, that, that just le- leads to, to a situation where our whole team is completely out of position. So, yeah, from, from there, people make runs into the box. Sure. Other than that, I I don't think Busquets has been particularly sharp on the ball this season. No. Um, And I believe that is a bigger issue than Busquets' transition defense because we have not seen many problems with Busquets' transition defense. Um, So it's, uh, it's the thing that people love to talk about because it is easy. He's slow. So if you concede... It's the slow guy's fault, but we have not really seen it. What we ha- what we have seen is him not really making that much of a difference 
when we do have possess possession. Whether mm -hmm. it's because um, the movement around them is not good enough, or whether it's because he is not sharp enough. Well, you know, against Inter, he was not sharp enough. For example, we and, and he gave like he had like three or four bad giveaways against Inter. It was not just the one where they, that they uh, capitalized on. Um, and I think that that is more of an issue, where you can say, well, maybe maybe if we make the switch to Frankie, um, our midfield midfield will function better going forward. Yeah, I mean, the the only thing is that I want people to be prepared for is when that happens and when that day comes. Like Terry Henry was on a, a podcast recently, I think it was the Red Bulls podcast, where he he kind of laid out this point about diagonal balls. It was just wonderful. And I keep thinking about the last few days that we don't understand how hard it is to hit a 50 yard diagonal ball behind the fullback in in motion, like as it's happening, like in, in real time, as quickly as the likes of Busquets does. Like, And without Frankie, I mean, with Frankie in there, you might see things are more dynamic, like I'm asking for. You might think, see certain things are better, but you're also going to be missing things. Mm, like those yeah. those balls are not going to come off at that kind of rate. They're not going to come off and succeed in that way. So there is this, again, there's also this world where the speed of which the ball gets from the midfield to the wingers. I also keep hearing this really tired thing when I hear like new commentators do a Barca game for the first time this season. And they say that the ball moves too slow. And I think that's kind of reductive. It, it, it's not necessarily moving too slow. It's that it's not penetrating the spots of teams that are parking the bus where it needs to penetrate, which is different than moving slow because Barcelona gets the ball out to the wings very, very mm -hmm. quickly. They also rotate horizontally the ball very, very quickly. The ball does move for Barcelona, but without either penetrative runs or without balls that are hit well enough to penetrate in the right spots, then you don't get the proper movement. And therefore, at the end of it, you don't get when Barcelona have all these passes, you don't get the shot on goal or you don't get the goal, right? And so that's when people are able to say over and over again, the ball moves too slowly. And so Frankie de Young, if you think the ball moves too slowly now, and if you're going to be reductive about that critique of Barca, when Frankie's the pivot, it's going to move way, way slower because <laughs> Frankie also takes one or two extra touches almost every time that Busi does. So you are giving something away because, I mm -hmm. mean, again, is Frankie de Young the, the, the pivot at Barcelona? No, but that's the whole point about the pivot at Barcelona. Right. right? The, the, the world is changing and, you, to deal with counterattacking teams and the speed of which teams counterattack nowadays, again, like they did years and years ago, like you, you have got to have dynamism in your midfield with three different midfielders that can go, go forward at times or come back. Or, I mean, but you also have to ask, do you want to play that well, way? I mean, because Barca and Xavi might say, we don't want to play that way at all. Because again, you look at that Liverpool Man City game, that game, even though it was only one nothing, like they were up and down. Like, I mean, do, do you really want to play with those kind of risks? Like, I mean, is that the way that? Barcelona wants to play. I don't think Xavi wants to play that way at all. No, we don't. Uh, we don't want to play in that way. And it's you know, it's not as if uh, uh, constantly playing playing box to box uh, is the only way of playing football. Or only way, uh, only way to win. You need to be able to slow down uh, sometimes when it is your to your advantage, and you need to be able to recognize the space in front of you when it's to your advantage as well. Um, but obviously, if you play, um, if you always play vertically which is one of the mistakes that we've been making, then you also leave a lot of space in between the lines. Uh, you know, you, you lose. Uh, you cannot be compact if uh, you, you, you always look for the space, the space ahead of you um, and not also for the organization. However, I do, I do think that uh, Frankie de Jong um, has a chance to grow his ball circulation abilities. You know, because it's, it's it's not as if we never see him do it. Um, he just needs to do mm -hmm. it more often. And he needs to, uh, like Xavi needs to uh, make sure that um, people are positioned so that Frankie de Jong actually has those spaces uh, in order to circulate the ball fast. Because some, sometimes what happens is, you know, uh, un unless you're, you're Busquets, and you don't have the the strength of uh, carrying the ball that the young has, so you will automatically always look for the pass. Um, sometimes the space is not there, or not as obvious. Um, but again, like you know, this is there. There will always be a trade-off. 
Uh, so if you play Frankie instead of Busquets, yeah, maybe Frankie uh, does not hurt your transition defense because he's slow. He's going to hurt your transition defense because his positioning is not as good. Or he's going. Yeah, which is not. Or he's. Yeah, which, which is, is not. not. Or he's going to uh, hurt your defense uh, because his tackling is poor. You know, Bus- Busquets, when somebody comes at him, um, he, he will challenge for the ball a lot better than Frankie challenges for, for divided balls. So uh, Frankie's going to hurt our defense in in, in other ways. Um, yeah, the other little thing he does, though, by the way, De Young, that really frustrates me is we saw it today. Twice he got caught out of position. Instead of helping Roberto on Vinny Jr., he, he was trying to talk to the ref, and he just, like, mm-hmm. Frankie has a way of kind of whining at the ref that gets him out of position. Like, you notice that when Boosie does it and Demolay do it, they do it usually after the play has stopped. But Frankie has a habit of doing it as it's happening always, in live time. And it's like always. twice, two or three times a day that it almost got him caught. And yeah, that, yeah. that tends to be a bit frustrating. I'm, he doesn't. Know. They, I mean, not something you just got to fix. Like you got to get that's something that's there's no excuses to that one. You just you can't do Fra- that. Fra- Frankie is the kind of player if, if 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 he has a penalty and he hits the ball, uh, he hits the ball, uh, he takes the penalty and he hits the, the bar and it comes bouncing back to him instead of shooting it into the goal, uh, he will still be like crying over having missed his shot. Like, you know, he has this thing where um, when something does not go his way in an immediate play, uh, his his first reaction is to, to lament, lament whatever did not work instead of focusing on what is happening on the pitch. Um, and it's really weird that this keeps happening because he's 25 years old now. It's something that I've noticed like years and years and years. And I don't understand why no coach has literally like grabbed him by the shirt, pushed him against the wall, slapped him across the the face a couple of times and told him, concentrate on the effing play. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, this is, this is something that can change. Um, I'm also Mm -hmm. of the opinion that we have the quality on the pitch that if, if coached correctly against most teams, we can play with Frankie instead of Busquets. Why? Well, because we have Ter Stegen, because we have Koundé, because we have Araujo, because we have Christensen, because we have Pedri, because we have Gavi, because we have Frankie, because we have Busi, because we have Lewandowski, because we have Dembele, because we have Rafinha, because we have Anzu. Um, most, most other clubs don't have all of those players. Yeah. So... Um, why not? Why not? What what I think is not going to work is not to rotate. Like we have to rotate in in the matches to come, um, just just for the emotional and the mental effect. Wow. Yeah. Well, speaking of whining, uh, I think the next thing we should hit is the two big calls in the game, which was obviously the one the hip to hip Kavahal and Lewandowski. The referee does not, I mean, I put this in my five headlines. It was frustrating to me that he did not go to the monitor for that one. It would have taken a lot to overturn it. That is fair. That because Kavahal, I mean, it looked like their legs got wrapped together. And I've heard that in the referee's report that I guess doesn't come out for a little while, but I've heard that they, the argument that VAR made was that Lewandowski was always going down. Uh, it was due to momentum and Kavahal just gave him a little hip touch. And then the Eric Garcia with the, maybe the bottom of his toe, winds up touching Rodrigo. Rodrigo goes down, and that is 3-1, and that's the game after Barcelona got in the 2-1 back through, to uh, Ansu's. Well, I'd say Ansu's, but Ferran Torres scored, <laughs> but Ansu created the goal, of course. I'd, so, I'd... with yeah, with those two calls, I mean, the, the ref goes to the, the monitor for one for the Garcia-Rodrigo incident, doesn't go to the monitor for Carvajal-Lewandowski, and my frustration, I mean, that's where my frustration begins with it, because if you're going to if there's enough to overturn the one, because he didn't call a penalty on the Garcia Rodrigo, that was an overturn call. So that had to be, what is it? Clear and defined. What, what is the official term? I think it's clear and defined to be overturned. I I, and yet the other one you didn't even look at that, that, that is what flabbergasted me comparing the two. With I thought other. Eric's was super clear. So, you no, know, I thought, I thought it was a penalty when I first saw it. And then, and, and then when, when they showed the other angles, uh, you know, it's it's so obvious that he steps on his foot. So, um, yeah, no, I've, I, 
I have no issue with that whatsoever. Also, remember, it's the VAR that needs to say that it's clear before the referee even takes a look at it. It's not the referee right. who takes a look at it and then says, oh, this is clear enough for me to overrule it. No. It has to be like super clear in order for the referee to, to actually take a look at it. Um, as for Lewandowski's, I think it was a penalty. I think there was a contact with the legs as well. Um, but I did not see any angles where it is showed, where it is shown like super clearly. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, was it a penalty? Probably. Um, do I think it's a disgrace that it was not given? No. No. And and neither did the players. Because you also see how they react when, right. you know, like you see when they react when it's something that could have been given and you see how they react when a travesty has just happened. Yeah, the Dumfries handball, exactly. that was yeah. the one. Of the last few weeks, that was the one mm -hmm. that the players were like, no, exactly. no, no, this, that can't, was the one. this can't be So this that, that, there were two calls that did not go our way, like two um, free kicks right outside of the area. That did not go away uh, our way. I think there was one, uh, one the other way around. That uh, where we made a clear foul uh, around our area, and uh, the ref waved it off. Um, for me, the Eric Garcia penalty uh, is more. Why does Eric Garcia cause that penalty? He did not really need. Why, yeah, he why does he step? On, 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 yeah, I mean, onto his foot, you know. He he does that. You know, I, I I was thinking about that. He does it every time, and I'm wondering. And it seems to be that, if I'm not mistaken, it's with his left foot that he steps in with. And I wonder, as as much as as far as at the back, what ball playing center back is best? I mean, they're all right footed, and Eric usually plays on the left because he is better on his uh, well, not on his left, but he's the best ball playing center back at the back with either foot. So he usually goes as a left back, uh, the left center back, mm -hmm. if you will, then Kunde was on the right for this one. So I wonder because he's on the opposite side, like usually it's, Oh, that defender can't play the ball well with his opposite foot or with his right with his left foot, but it's not the ball playing. that's the issue. It's that it seems to be, he steps forward on the wrong opposite foot as if he's more comfortable trying to defend and kind of cut down that space and step in with his right, which is his natural foot. And it's just, it seems to be awkward every time. Like he's slow or he's not balanced when he tries to step on the opposite side. And that's the only thing I can think of as to why he keeps making these errors. Cause it seems like even, uh, you know, I played baseball growing up and they would say when you're in the outfield, you know, it, you want to take a step back and then you assess the play. Then you run forward to the ball. And there are guys who just jump right at it and go right mm -hmm. to it. And I think that Eric Garcia, because he's so reactive is stepping back with the wrong foot. And then when it's time to step in, he's then stepping forward with his opposite foot and putting his weight in the wrong direction. So that's the only, that's my only like trying to Zubruder film it or try yeah. to figure out frame by frame what he's doing wrong. Uh, but I, I, that's the only idea. Interesting. I well, I think what, what is frustrating about Eric Garcia is not that he's so good on the ball uh, and so poor at defending. Um, it's more that 95% of the time he defends really well. But the 5% the mm -hmm. that he, of the time that he doesn't, it pretty much cost us a goal. It's a goal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a goal yeah. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so it's Lang it's Lang Lay syndrome, basically, in Lang Lay's last season. That's what Lang Lay was. Lang Lay would defend, 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 and then he would one error and that's it. And now then Lang Lay's the scapegoat. So yeah, that 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 is frustrating. Um the other frustrating thing is uh is, is Ansu uh in front of goal. Um I'm thinking he'll snap out of it. Like uh it looks like it's a mental thing more than, than a physical thing. But um, he had a good, really good chance at an equalizer. When we started pushing them the last uh, 15, 20 minutes, because I think the first half, I don't think we were the worst team. I think we, we, we played quite quite well the first half. Then, then the second half, you could see that mentally and emotionally we were, we were affected. And the first 30 minutes, uh, Madrid was clearly better than us. Um, but then those, those last 15, 15 minutes when we started pushing more, we started creating chances again, man. Um, so, yeah, the, 
the, yeah, the, I mean, the, Farron the, Torres, the, Gabi, Alba, and Ansu changed the, the game. Like, those subs did inject the game with some life yeah, that it the, needed, the, yeah. The Torres goal, uh, Ansu had a really good chance as well. Uh, it was less than a meter away. If he got his, I mean, if he gets his, I, I mean, it was it was a tough shot, though. It was, it was hard to get his weight over it and get it in that post. Come on, this, um, and that was, it, it was a tough finish. This is a player who, like... Last year or the year before, like that, that is a goal. That is a goal. Like that, that would be a goal for him, ten yards further away from the goal. You know, there's some, there's something going on with this kid mentally, yeah. where, you know, he's he's afraid of scoring goals now. Um, so yeah, no, I, I thought that you know we, we if, if some of the breaks go our way. We come out of uh, San Siro with a win. We win at home, and we win at the Bernabeu. Um, yeah. in, instead, we have this huge mess, um, which, which is pretty much why I did not want us to sign all of these players to begin with, uh, because we're spending more money, uh, and the, the team is under so much, so much more pressure to deliver than we would have been. Had we just, uh, you know, trusted trusted the people that we already had, uh, w- with Kistensen and and Cassie, uh, on our squad as well. Because what did we do at the Benoeo last season? We won four zero. Charlie was a genius. You know, not. Do you think that conversation starts and ends with Lewandowski though? Because Lewandowski, I think singularly more than any other player that is brought in, Kunde, Rafinha, doesn't matter. By adding Lewandowski to your squad, you change the expectations. You change the pressure. You change everything. Like the look of your squad changes once you add that player in. And there is an argument looking at the goal scoring though this season that if that fatal marble flaw, you know, like Marvel comments, like if Dembele, I mean, Rafinha was added too, but if Dembele, Rafinha, Ferran Torres, and Ansu all had these issues and Lewandowski wasn't signed, well, I mean, Obama Yang would still be around, so maybe Obama Yang does pick up some of the slack. But like Lewandowski's been the leading scorer in the Liga. Like Lewandowski's been firing on all cylinders, and he's won Barcelona single handedly along with Ter Stegen, won Barcelona points this season. So there is this universe. There is that universe where you don't bring him in, you don't increase all the pressure and make everything nuts, but you also don't wind up getting. And you can see this project continues on or, in this way. Or, or some of those goals will come from from other players. You don't know that, and. Um, and, and, no, you don't. But, I mean, Lewandowski scores and, goals. That's and, what he and does. Like, you lower the risk of not scoring goals by bringing him and, in. And regardless, I'm not saying that without these signings, uh, we would be where we are right now, which is two points behind the leaders. No, we might be further uh, away from Madrid. Uh, I, I'm saying we would not be under so much pressure to deliver. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Um, yeah. I mean, Mar- once you sign Marcus Alonso, you've got to win the Champions League, right? <laughs> That's what. They're saying. I, I gotta give you Marcus Alonso. We didn't need to sign Marcus Alonso. I, I, I also think that there might even be um, be a universe where we don't make those signings and we get the same group of death, but uh, but we come out of it better because mm-hmm. because Inter does not uh, defend with uh, eleven players in Milan, and because we we're, we're not so anxious with the with the need to uh, to beat them. Uh, but because we're young and not afraid of losing. You know, so, um, yeah, who knows? Who knows? But yeah, the, who knows? the squad is what we, what it is. Um, who the signing I'm probably happiest about is Kunde. Just because of what Kunde will mean for us going forward the next couple of years. Um, I thought he played mm-hmm. really well today, by the way. He did. Yeah. He put a half a step wrong, and he made up for it. Yeah. He was really good. Yep. Yeah, I agree with that. Kunde is the most important. I, I said it when uh, when they signed him, well, talking to the, the podcast mm-hmm. that he was signed, that he was the most important one yeah. moving forward. So, all right, that will put El Clasico to bed. Um, yeah, so, Levon, uh, yeah, before we get into other big picture stuff, I thought, you know, I think we had a pretty good discussion about that game. Any, any final thoughts? Anything we missed? <sighs> nah, it's just depressing, bro. I agree. So 
in in that depression and uh so if our listeners if you do like to hear my voice to make you feel better unfortunately i can't help you for the next week because i'm going uh i will be away for the next week you will not hear from me for villarreal maybe the patrons will the patrons might hear from my reaction if i get to see villarreal um but i will be uh not in bar not in levon's neck of the woods but i will be in europe so um i, I guess i'm doing some scouting or something i don't know what i'm doing but uh, i will be gone for a week and then i will be back for uh, the following week and we'll have podcasts and all that stuff. So uh, it's uh, it's a week away, not a big deal. But yeah, so I will not be here after the Villarreal. So don't expect a podcast, uh, a second one coming out this week, as in this is coming out on Monday. So don't expect a second one this week. And I'll talk to you again, that one. So if you want to follow him on Twitter, again, that's down in the show notes. We're Instagram and Twitter at the Barcelona Pod, Hilton D13 for me, Facebook, Patreon, YouTube, Merch Store, you know all that stuff. So thanks so much for listening to the show. Do thick and thin, no matter what happens in El Clasico, you know, you move on. The spring is a whole different year. World Cup's a nice little break. So we move. Thanks so much for listening to the show. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Enforce Sports.